subject. Uh, then we will go uh, further uh, to the big ontologies by Antonio Castro. Uh, and finally, uh, going to a, a complex problem in architecture, hospitals. Uh, Johan van der Sart will speak exactly about this, the use of, of big technology in the modeling, uh, in, still in the management of hospitals uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. So, Miguel, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, um, today I'm going to speak about um, metropolitan morphology. And uh, I will try to argue two things. First is that um, metropolitan morphology is something that we know very little about. Uh, actually, uh, really pretty much almost nothing. And the second thing is that uh, network, uh, special network analysis can help us uh, on that question, which remains open. So, uh, when we start by these two corporations, that you might notice that they are 40 years apart from each other, but they say mostly the same thing. They say that we don't know anything about metropolitan morphology and we should. Uh, this one is from a very important uh, paper from Friedman and Miller that says that planets are left in the boundary because uh, metropolitan trends have destroyed the traditional uh, image, CP image and uh, there is nothing to, to substitute it. But we need, there is very much a need for such an image if only to serve as a basis for organizing our story. And the other one is from three authors, but among them I'm Fernando Dom, which is a very well-known morphologist, which says that today, so 2009, completely contemporary, posing the concept of metropolitan formula as a question is an absolute necessity. So uh, in 40 years, almost uh, nothing has been found regarding this, even though many works have been done, but this remains uh, an open question as yet. So uh, here I try to show you more or less what the problem is. We, we know what this is, more or less, and also what this is, and we still know what this is, but we don't have morphology, morphologically a model for that. So, uh, contemporary metropolitan areas are always characterized by a position with a traditional city. We, we think of the traditional city as the city with good form, or as the form that we understand, and the contemporary metropolitan fringes as the city without form. Uh, meaning by that, that we don't understand it. So uh, there's a negative conceptual charge in this that uh, tends to lead a positive analysis, so a kind of analysis that don't depend on previous things that we know. And the many terms on the specific literature, like generic city, city without model, exploded city, fractured metropolis, uh, or anything else, uh, tend to reflect this, this bias. So when we look at, at these two images, one is from Central Porto and another one is somewhere in uh, the metropolitan periphery, uh, we see that here we see lots of things that we know. We have well-defined streets, we have blocks, we have plots, we have buildings, we have plots that are almost entirely occupied, public space is very well defined. We know what is public, what is not. This is what we normally think of uh, what the city is. And here we have something very different. We have small buildings, huge buildings, large 
pieces of open space, we have agriculture, agriculture we have industry, we have, we have everything mixed up. And um, apparently there is no possible uh, kind of um, way to conciliate this with that. But uh, what I'm going to try to argue is that there is a common thing between the two things, which is this, and this is the public space system of both uh, examples. And this is, is pretty much the same thing. It's made of the same thing, it's made of space, it is a network, it is a network, and as a network, it is a, a relational object made of elements in relation with each other. And the form of it is, of course, quite different, but we have the tools to analyze both and to try to understand which are the differences between both things. So uh, this is our, this, these are the arguments. So the analysis of urban spatial networks is context independent. It can be applied in any kind of setting, in urban settings, of course, that's what we are talking about. Traditional, contemporary, central, or, or peripheral, it doesn't matter. It is rigorous and mathematical, mathematically based. Uh, this is not per se uh, you know, a fundamental thing, but of course it helps. And it describes the morphology of the most important object in the city, which is a public space system, which is the thing that we all use and which is the thing that actually moves the city together. And it can deal with systems of any size, which is also a very important question because traditional morphological and analytical methods uh, were devised for small towns, typical historical towns uh, of the kind of left images, image that we saw before, and are very laborious and time consuming methods. Uh, but uh, with special network analysis, we can uh, actually analyze systems of any size beyond the limitation being computer power. Uh, and also it is scale independent, which is not the same thing of, of, of what I was talking about before. It has not, nothing to do with size. It has to do with the fact that we can, within the same model, analyze the scale of the neighborhood or even the scale of the street segment up to the scale of the region or up to the limits of the model that we have all within the same model. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Porto metropolitan region, uh, which is uh, around this place here, Gray is the sea, of course. Uh, and I have constructed a model uh, within a circle of 30 kilometers radius center around Porto. Um, this is the built uh, built tissue of the region, so quite dispersed, as you can see. Here uh, we see the, the polygons with a bigger area in black, and the gray, the polygons with, with small areas, so it gives us an idea of concentration, so an overglomeration. Uh, so we, we have Porto City with some referral cities around it. We have some satellite cities. Uh, in the middle of these, we have diffuse urbanization. In blue, we have industry that you can also see that is spread all over the place. So no kind of functional differentiation. Over this, we have a network of highways and, and principal uh, uh, main roads, which irrigates all these. Uh, and, but not of all it's built, we also have this, which is uh, in national climes, it, it's nature, so forest mainly. And in, uh, in green, these green areas are actually agricultural plots, so that's lot, there's lots of agriculture there, uh, which makes uh, tissue, which is this. And the question is, how are we going to build this? How, how shall we analyze this thing? Uh, 
this patchwork of agriculture mixed with buildings, with the filigrane of small streets, with highways in between, with forests in the middle. And it just gets worse because when, when we actually, when we look at the real thing, uh, it's actually something quite different from the city and uh, quite different, this difficult to plan. What shall we do with this? What is this? This is the question that I would like to ask. So, um, I have built this, this uh, actual model. I'm not going to try to explain all the measures and methods. Uh, I will go quite quickly. Uh, anything that you don't understand, please either interrupt or ask uh, later. The model is very detailed. It has a every street. Uh, this red panel here is that one. And this one is this one. So you can see that it has every street. Uh, it has a total length of almost 10,000 kilometers within the bed circle. What I've done was to uh, recreate this in, into four temporal moments. I'm also not going to explain how I've done it. Uh, there's a paper there, it's all uh, open source. Uh, you can read it without paying. And I have modeled this into four different periods. This is the, the contemporary uh, version of the model, and I also have a version for 98, 77, and 51. And so this gives us four models of the, the public space system of the metropolitan region. And uh, over this, I have made a series of analyses of uh, spatial network centrality measures. And uh, this is enough to, I'll try to show that that is enough to give us some clues. But when we apply spatial network analysis to such large networks, it also raises another problem, which is a problem of very high dimensionality of data. Because this is what spatial network analysis does. For instance, this is its closeness, which is the distance of each space to every other space within a given uh, radius. Uh, there you have uh, 400 meters radius, so more or less 10 minutes walking, all the way down to 30 kilometers. Uh, as usual, blue signif uh, means very distant from everything, and red means close. But we have this conundrum here. We have lots of information, we can see lots of structures here, many uh, little centers everywhere that start to grow into small cities or sub-cities and then you can see the, the metropolitan core appearing uh, so structures overlapping into other structures but what to, to do what shall we do with all this data it seems to, to, to have um, lots of information in it but uh, difficult to analyze for the more because uh, like the frames of the motion picture, these centrality patterns are very alike to each other. This one is not like this one, but this one is pretty much like this one, and this one is pretty much like this one, so this is very gradual, it's like a film, it's like a movie. But also like a movie if we just, uh, just because we choose, oh, I want this one, and that one, and that one. And what about all the information in the new we lose that information. And exactly like a movie, if we choose just to visualize this frame and this frame and that frame, the movie disappears. This can actually be shown. Yeah, OK, it's a movie. Uh, and as you see, uh, what happens is that the spatial network is actually a, a, a very high dimensional object. This, each range is, is the value, the centrality value of each space at each range is, is a dimension. So each space is actually a very high dimensional entity. You can see that there are spaces that are important 
at the neighborhood scale, for instance here, and they still are important for the uh, upper, uh, but then they, became, they become blue. And at the same time, there are spaces that are always important. And then there are spaces that are not important at certain scales, but then become important at others, at other scales, and then lose importance. So, uh, it, it is not enough to just make a model, run an analysis, and look at it. We need, in some way, to capture all this information, because it's exactly in the variability of that information that spaces in the metropolitan region <coughs> may be differentiated from each other. So, another way of representing this is, is, is like this data cube that you see here. Uh, which is a single x, y coordinates. So you can see each of these surfaces as a centrality pattern. And then the, the other axes are gray. And if this dot is a space, the only way to really characterize this space is by all its images on all these dimensions. So the question is, how shall we do it? Uh, and the way to do it is with data mining techniques. So uh, this is my second argument, or uh, perhaps it's the third that I haven't said before. That is, uh, yes, uh, special network analysis can help us in metropolitan morphology, but we need to, um, to combine it with statistics with statistics and the exploratory and statistical analysis to really uh, get the most of it. Uh, so this is another way of showing that everything, that, that, that each uh, ray is highly correlated with, with the others. These are heat maps representing uh, correlation co coefficients. And as, as you see, and, uh, okay, and this is closeness centrality and this is dependence centrality. Uh, I will try to explain very quickly. Closeless centrality measures the distance of each space to other uh, spaces in the network. Between centrality measures the number of times each space lies in the shortest paths between every other two spaces. So this is a measure of flow, of flow potential of a space. A space with I between centrality is a space where lots of people pass. And closeness centrality is a measure of uh, how close the space is to all others, so how probably a space may act as a destination from all others. But what these heat maps show is that correl the correlations between uh, each centrality level are really high, and they are not. They are, uh, they are only low when you take, for instance, ray 400 and correlate it with ray 30 kilometers. Because, as you uh, fortunately, there is a statistical method to cope just with this kind of situation. And that is principal component analysis. Principal component analysis is a method to, it's, it's, it's called a dimension <coughs> redu reduction method which is used when you, we have a, a set of variables which are highly correlated with each other, so that we know that they might be saying slightly different things, but they all are also saying the same thing in some sense. So we try to reduce them and, and to transform those variables into a, a new set of variables, which encapsulates the, the, the latent uh, meaning of the variables. Here you can see there are three dimensions, S1, S2, and S3, and a set of points. This is a Wikipedia image taken directly from Wikipedia. And there are a set of points um, described in the three dimensions. But as you can see, there is a general trend on this uh, direction in, in the data. And then there is a second trend, not so strong, in this direction. So this is, this is the first principal component of this data set, and this is the second principal component of this data set. There are some technical explanations here about eigenvectors and other things, but 
such that is not very important. What is important is that if we apply principal components to all to these, right? Because each of these rain are a dimension, is, uh, is a dimension, and if we try to reduce these dimensions into their latent variables, we might discover uh, we might discover uh, characteristics, modulations of centrality within uh, that uh, attitude that I have shown. And what these graphs show is the correlation. Uh, so I have uh, extracted three principal components for each uh, centrality measure. Uh, the reason they are three is because the three first principal components have eigenvalues higher than one. Uh, this is a technical matter, but uh, that eigenvalues higher than one are the, the principal components that matter. You can take that for granted, but I may explain why in the end. Um, but what the graphs show is the correlation of each component with the original variables. So this scale here is simply person's product moment correlation with one perfect correlation and zero uh, no correlation at all. And what you see is that the first principal component, and I take, uh, I could take another value, for instance, 0.5, I took 0.6 just because it, 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 it helps me to separate uh, the, the, the three scales. But of course, these are continuum phenomena. They are not uh, completely separated from each other. But the first component clearly is describing the rating that, that go be beyond, for instance, 8 kilometers. So this, this principal component describes the region scale. And then you have a second principal component which gets high correlations here uh, from 1,200 uh, 1, meters to 8 kilometers, more or less. So the city scale. And then you have another principal component that is meaningful with a high correlation with initial variables, only really at the local scale. So this is the neighborhood scale. And this is one thing. This is meaningful because we have uh, this intuitive notion that probably in a metropolitan region there should be at least three scales, yes? The neighborhood, local scale, the city scale of the several cities of the metropolitan region and the, re and the scale of the whole region. But what this shows that is that this is actually true because this is derived only from a model which represents a physical object, which is the public space system. And this object, when uh, analyzed by centrality measures, actually has only these three kind of regimes, let's say, of modulations. And furthermore, even if the network uh, grows a lot for a long time, really a lot, almost doubles, they are completely constant over time. So, you see, uh, in the 60 years of this study, starting in the, in the 1950s, uh, there were almost no highways, uh, motorways mainly, uh, and at the end there is this huge motorway system, but it seems that all these structures actually occupy only these centrality slots. In the beginning, there were no motorways, but there were uh, main roads, yes? Main roads, which, which were here almost from the time of the Romans. And they had this role of connecting the region. And then motorways appear, but motorways just take over the role of those roads and work at this centrality region. So this is the first finding that apparently when planners think about, and of course I am only talking about spatial, spatial and physical planning, I'm not talking about functional planning or anything like that, I'm talking about this architective-minded kind of planning. Uh, planners should only, or 
needs only to think about three spatial scales. Structures made for the neighborhood, structures made for the city scale, and structures made for the regional scale. So this is, uh, I believe, a huge simplification of the initial problem. And then these principal components can actually become new variables. So now we don't we already don't need to see all those centrality patterns. We can only look at three centrality patterns for each uh, type of measure. Closeness and decrease. And as you can see, the region uh, shows the, the metropolitan core and, and, uh, and, and the structures around. Then the city scale shows uh, all the peripheral cities, some structures here which are actually emergent. They, they are not cities and they don't have names. But well, they do have names for it. For instance, this is Gervais here, which is an emergent centrality, as some of you might know. And then you have this cloud of uh, small places. So we can see this as metropolitan places, and then we can see this as metropolitan paths. And here you see all the network of uh, main roads and, and motorways. And then here you see the more um, micro network of, of, of city paths and here you have neighborhood paths. Uh, so now we uh, have all these this data cubes made of, of, many, of as many slices as <coughs> we wanted actually, but now we have reduced it to only three slices, the neighborhood, the city and the region scale. <coughs> and now we just need to characterize each space, its image on three slices instead of, uh, uh, I don't know how many others that we have. And uh, what I wanted to show here is that these two things are not the same. This is the first principal component, and this is the, the gradient at which it has the maximum correlation. And as you can see, the pattern is actually very different. What happens here is that structures that uh, are continuously high on, on, on all those scales get amplified. And structures that are, for instance, high at this rating, but is, are not at that rating, are like attenuated. You see? So actually, this thing is many things at the same time. It's not, it's not as, as if I just came here and took a slice, another slice, and then another slice. What PCA does is to take these slices and merge them together. And all those slices will merge them. So uh, this has become simpler already. We only have so three slices that I was saying. But now we have the objects, that is the spaces. And we have, for instance, spaces that are only important on this slide, slice. And then we have, for instance, here another space that might be important on these two slices. Another one that is just important on the middle of the slice. Another one that is important on all slices. And uh, how can we characterize this? Because perhaps it's, it is exactly these that, that, that makes spaces different from each other. And because we only have three dimensions here, we can actually visualize this. Uh, this is uh, between us and that is closeness. And as you can see, these clouds of points, this each, each of these dots is a space in the network, are highly structured. You see all those spikes there, and these like these two wings here. Those, so it, is, it is clearly uh, a, a, a thing full of structure. And, and the way to do this is with another data mining technique, which, which is called clustering, which tries to uh, aggregate uh, objects which are similar to each other. Well, I, I use the k-means algorithm, which is just one of the immense number of clustering algorithms. It's the most common. And uh, this is how it works. Uh, I will try to explain very big, quickly. Three, if you need to choose the number of clusters you want to find in the beginning. Three in this case. Three points are selected randomly. And the points more near to those points become cluster. So we have three processes. And then the centroid is moved, the, the, the initial point is moved to the centroid of, of this cluster. And
and then again this is iterated and the central moves again and when the central has stopped moving a local minima was found and so the, the initial set of points uh, uh, become clustered into mini meaningful sets as you can see uh, points may change clusters for instance these points here were on the red cluster but they end up in the blue cluster and um, actually, uh, it, what I found is there is a, a wealth of structure in the middle of these. Uh, these are the clusters that I found with closeness, and these are the clusters I found with cleanness. And these uh, plots here show the behavior of this type of spaces along the initial variables. So you have a cluster which is, I call, then, uh, then you can give, of course, names to these things. And I gave some fancy names. I call that the metropolitan kernel. Uh, I call these inner core cities, I think, uh, satellite cities, uh, nebula of microcenters. Names are not very important. What is important is that these are actually structures that were even in the beginning of, and even in the oceans of that. And again, you can see that, and I believe that this is a kind of proof that these things are actual and real. They are very stable in time. They show slight variations at each moment in time, but not very strong or uh, or random, let's say, for instance, this cluster here of choice modifies itself a long time, but modifies on a certain trend. Uh, and these, these, these are the, the shares of the clusters. They also change slightly. Some, for instance, the outer, outer satellite cities lose many spaces. The, the metropolitan kernel grows a long time. Uh, well, these things change, but they don't change randomly, and they don't change as much as one would expect in a thing that is not representing reality. And uh, now I sh will show you just, uh, well, you cannot see very well, but the, the, the spaces of the clusters are represented with red lines. This is the city of Trophus. And these are two clusters. This is the outer satellite city cluster. And as you can see, the city center is very well captured. And this is the, I call the constellation of local center. And you can see that exactly on the same place, suddenly, a completely set of spaces is selected by this cluster, which are small neighborhoods. And you can see how the profile of the thing is completely different. This one is high on local scales and slightly high also on, on, on long scales. And uh, well, it is, it is different. So this is uh, closeness, this is betweenness. You have here the cluster of city paths, so the main roads of cities, the cluster of neighborhood paths. And uh, so, this is the process. We need to, to analyze things with the uh, network, uh, special network analysis, but we have this very high dimensional problem. We can reduce this with principal component analysis, and then we can further reduce it, it with cluster analysis. Uh, finally, um, I would like to show you a later uh, 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 a last consequence of all this. So these are the clusters that I found, and this is their behavior on the three dimensions uh, found with principal component analysis. Uh, they, as you can see, they change little over, over time. Some s uh, change more. Uh, the red line is the last period. These inner satellite cities gain a lot of neighborhood centrality in the last period, uh, but they are quite stable. And also the, the between centrality uh, clusters, 
this one here, City Notes, which is actually uh, quite interesting because this place, this place, and these spaces here make the connection between these ones and that ones that have a more changeable um, behavior. But what is nice is now that we have these uh, graphs here, which actually represent the, 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 the three uh, parameters of the centroid of each cluster, and we can classify these centroids. Each of these initial uh, points of the general grams. Uh, this is a hierarchical clustering procedure. Probably some of you know what this is. These are the initial centroids, and you can see as and, and what this does is. It, it merges things that are much uh, more alike um, as you go up uh, the, the hierarchy. So this, these things are obviously alike because they are the centroids of the original paths cluster. If it was not like that, it, I, I would be very worried because it would mean that what I was doing it was all wrong. But of course, the, the centroids of each cluster at each time moment are initially merged. But then you can see that these secondary city paths and primary city paths are quickly merged into a, a new cluster here. And only later in the clustering procedure they are merged with the city nodes, which by, by, by the turn are merged with neighborhoods. This can help us do our kind of anatomies of the metropolitan region, or taxonomies organized classifications of the metropolitan region. So this, these are diagrams which uh, are made uh, sorry, are made from this. This is the technical thing. This is the thing for uh, people to understand. Um, and what this means is that in terms of what I have called places, the metropolitan region is actually made like this. It, it is made mainly and above all of the metropolitan core and all other places. And then if you want on a higher definition level, you can go down and then you have the, the central city, but then you have the outer core, and then you have this constellation of local centers, and then more peripheral places. And then you can go down this hierarchy into higher levels of definition. And, found and find uh, new things that the metropolitan region is made of. And of course, I'm always talking only spatially and physically. The metropolitan region is made of many other things, uh, but is also made of the street network, and that's what I'm talking about. And the utility of this is that now you can start to devise policies directed to these objects. You can imagine a policy directed to the central city. You can imagine policies directed to the outer satellite cities, and etc. etc. So, uh, to end and to wrap up this, I would say that we started with this epistemological problem, how to grasp metropolitan morphology. It is graspable. Uh, we now have tools to start to understand what these strange objects, which are metropolitan regions, actually are made of. And we have a complex analytical situation how to deal with the eye dimensionality of these things. And so I have tried to show that urban spatial networks is a way of dealing with metropolitan morphology, capable of disclosing its fundamental structural components. And that coupling it with data mining, we can systematize all this into meaningful morphological examples. So, and this is the main message, is that these things are not significant guesses. Planning is mainly done, uh, even if with uh, lots of empiricity and lots of data, but it's done with lots of educated Yes, it's also. But these are actual structures which are derived only from the physical object itself. And so one thing is to intuit that the metropolitan region may be made like this or made like that. And another thing is to actually know which those scales of functioning and structural components are 
and so such information may start, I hope, to constitute the basis of an important empirical informed format for metropolitan and special.